I've been a very lucky person. After my good education, uh, I was coming from a business family, but uh, my brother was more appropriate than me to follow the, the business of my father. So I decided to go into public sector, and in particular, I started to work for Caritas, which in my country in Italy is the largest foreign aid NGO. And they worked for eight years for them, traveling around the world in more than 60 countries including Thailand during the time of the boat people. And then later on, uh, I left uh, the Bishop Conference to work for the United Nations, and the United Nations brought me all over the world. So what I'm telling you is a bit of theory, because we run a, a master course uh, on corporate social responsibility exactly in these days, and we have uh, uh, managers from all over the Asian region in our campus uh, in Patum Thani, exactly learning this thing. So there is a bit of theory, but I focus more on uh, my own experience, what I listen from people, because I think that putting the people at the center of whatever we do is very important for our own learning and our, our own uh, change. So what is the challenge? Today, we have uh, two billion people living on less than two dollars, two point five dollars a day. One billion of them have insufficient access to clean water. About 2.4 billion people are, have no decent energy source. 1.2 billion suffering from chronic hunger. All of this is morally unacceptable. It's an uh, omission. That means that not enough is being done. Is it a sin? Yes. It's a big global sin. And we have a responsibility for this situation. Chronic poverty challenge also the world justice. It is a fundamental challenge to this planet where humankind is now governing the creation. We can call this era Anthropocene, which means the era, the geological era, where everything is done by men and women, by people. We are controlling everything. It's the first generation on this planet where we are in charge of creation 100%. Despite the spectacular improvement in some part uh, of the world, including China, Thailand, Malaysia, and Brazil, still the Millennium Development Goals are not being implemented. Another big challenge is the climate change. It is one of the issues that threatens the, to exacerbate the situation and uh, raising sea levels, increasing drought uh, in drought prone areas, reducing crop yields big challenge for the survival of the planet. Why we arrived here? We arrived here because for more than a century we did it wrong. There was a massive uh, global increase of population without a good distribution. Then we will see what Father Neil already mentioned about migration, big injustice in migration. Global economy increased uh, in one century 14 times, industrial production 40 times, energy use carbon dioxide emissions dramatically increased 17 times, sulfur dioxide emission 13 times dam damaging the outside atmosphere, ocean fishing 35 times increase, number of peaks on earth, and so on and so forth. But some of fundamentals for our survival did not increase. The forest did not increase. The agriculture fields only doubled. Therefore, the food production has not been that much. And people? People are fundamentally unhappy. This is Ms. Lobna Helal, Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Egypt. She said that during the crisis in Egypt, the Arab Spring was above all an expression of discontent with economic condition and inequalities. She, is a, she has the rank of a minister in the government of Egypt, and of course, she was immediately fired. And she's now been fired. Why? Because she said the truth. People are reacting to economic condition of inequality. Inequality rules the world. The income of the world, the top 1.7% of people exceed those of the bottom 77%. It raises all sorts of questions, such as the role of development. What is development doing about that? The international migration issue, are we going to tolerate that uh, 100 million people are forced to, be, to live in a small place like Bangladesh? 
which is not bigger than Lombardy, one of the regions of Italy, and the global equality of opportunity. This is the first generation of human history. Since then, since the time of Adam and Eve, this is the first generation that can kill the next generation, can eliminate the possibility of the next generation to survive on this. So we need a major shift of, from poverty reduction to inclusive growth. We have to reconsider that the world has changed dramatically and new development challenges call for a new development framework. That's why the world is developing now a number of new approaches called, uh, in this way, uh, the fight against poverty, stand up, speak out, and poverty now. All of these movements, the Global Poverty Project, the Millennium Development Goals, and so on and so forth. I would like to mention among the many, I could run a complete mass of two years for you, but I think you have only uh, 45 minutes. So I would like to mention one of them, Jeffy Sachs, one of the guru of uh, uh, sustainable development, who says that the world is now sick. And using the analogy of sickness, that means we need uh, to treat the world like a patient. And every patient is different. We, dif we need a differential diagnosis. We need uh, monitoring and evaluation. We need professional standard of ethics, specifically tailored prescription. It is the end of ideology. Let us finish with ideology. Let us work only on evidence of what works and what does not work. Therefore, he has invented clinical economics. Uh, and what is your problem? You are the sick world where a lot of government corruption all over the world. If you mention the word corruption, people here at Thai, they think to Thai corruption. Well, I'm Italian, I think to Italian corruption. We got the Prime Minister corrupted. He has a, a long list of cases in the tribunal. I think it's, it's as, long, as long as the yellow pages, the number of corruption that we had there. And he remained Prime Minister. Legal and social disparities, di diseases like uh, HIV AIDS, lack of infrastructure, including communication, health, trade, unstable political landscape, protectionism, geographical barrier, barriers. Then there is the other BRICS. So uh, a lot of people talk about uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, the new big countries evolving. There is also one of my colleagues uh, in AIT invented the other BRICS, the one with the small letter, not the big letter, with bureaucracy, regulation, too many regulations, too much interventionism of the state uh, who pretend to run the market, corruption, sectarianism. We are deeply divided all over the world. And there is no way to run this planet with all of this fragmentation. So it's a time of paradigm shift. New development challenges call for a new development framework. I call it, it is my definition, a G7 challenge. What does it mean? That there are seven fundamentals which must be changed now. And the seven fundamentals are better governance. We are very badly governed. The system of democracy around the world is not performing. A few months ago, I was in the G8 meeting, and you have this Sherpa, the people who are the number two of the prime minister. One of them made a presentation on food security, which was very, very poor, ignorant. He does not know what the challenge is. A Sherpa, a number two of the G8 country, one of the biggest ones. I told him in private, sir, your presentation on food security was a shame. You come from one of the countries with the best university in the world. We all look to your university for, for the United Nations. This was a shame. Then later on in the, in the cocktail in the evening, the guy cashed me and saw the badge. Sandro, Sandro, come here. Tell, tell to the Prime Minister what you told me a few hours ago. I said, sir, yes. We have a problem here. If the Prime Minister office of such a big country think that the food security is about distributing food, no, that is not the issue. So the Prime Minister told me, ah, Sandro, I understand, you are one of those, thing, one of those people who are concerned about, about next generation, aren't you? And he said, yes, sir, I'm concerned about next generation. And the Prime Minister told me, well, look, Sandro, you might like it or not. You might agree it or not. But next generation does not vote for me and does not vote for the opposition. So they do not exist. 
This is the challenge of democracy. We have election in two years, we have election in three years. Many prime ministers around the world, G8 and G20, think with a time span of two years or three years. They don't have uh, the, the vision of creation. Then growth model is in crisis. The Gini index, that means the disparity between the richest and poor is growing. Global warming, gender and generation. Let us analyze them briefly. Glob globalization problem, introverted leadership, Prime Minister and President to say, my country first. No, there is no my country first. There is the planet first. First speech of President Obama to the United Nations. He started by saying, I will first serve the interest of my country. And I will not apologize to anybody of you here in this assembly for doing that. Luckily enough, he also added, the interests of the United Nations are the interests of everybody. So we need extraverted leadership to understand the, the interests of the others. Rising vulnerabilities, regional governance which does not work. Some regions like, for example, the, the group of independent states, the former Soviet Union, also ASEAN could do better, the African Union. Some regions are not performing properly. Is that globalization? No, it is not. It is semi-globalization. What has been globalized? Well, the Big Mac is, is globalized. Starbucks is globalized. Coca-Cola is globalized. But semi-globalization that we are not globalizing the people. Uh, can the people go around? Try, take a, a flight tomorrow and try to land in my country. They will not give you a visa like that. Goods can, can circulate, trade can circulate, money can go around, services can go around. The passport is not go, it's no good to go around. You need a credit card to go around. This is a theory of Pankaj Gemawat, a big professor who said that now capitalism is in crisis. Capitalism is becoming a big bubble and the bubble is going to explode and it will explode there first, Europe and the United States. That's why I agree with Father Neil. The future is about this side of the world, the East. The growth model is in crisis. Is uh, the gap between uh, rich and poor shrinking? Yes, the gap is shrinking because the riches are becoming every time richer and more heavy. And uh, the high consumption is causing a lot of deprivation. When, uh, whenever I'm invited here in many of these buffet, that there are so many buffets when you have big meetings and so on, that kind of consumption of so much meat every day, so much fish, and so, is not sustainable. There is not enough land in the world to produce all that meat for nine billion people. The Gini index is worsening. The, the difference between the richest and the poor. This is the, the income gaps, how many times the richest is richer than the poorest. Eh? And it's all, also always increasing. Global warming, a very interesting book here, The God Species, How the Planet Can Survive the Age of Humans. How the planet can survive the age of humans. So what we are doing on nanoplanetary boundaries and the environmental resources and so on. And then another, the G6 and the G7, the other two big challenges is generation. Are we saving this planet for our next generation? I got my second grandchild yesterday. So I'm concerned about next generation. I don't want to be the grandfather who made the, the life of my grandchildren impossible. And then the other injustice is about gender. For those people who are of my age, I see many here, this is the biggest shame of male people around the world. We male people in this hall, we should be ashamed of how we have allowed this fundamental injustice to continue for so long. Everywhere, practically in every environment, nobody excluded. In my country, women are not paid like men for the same job. And that is a G8 country. So let us talk about Myanmar or Bangladesh or Sri Lanka. Give it a big okay. Yes, we did that. But poverty as a woman face. We did that, but that half uh, which remains uh, is the wrong half. It's not half women, half men. 
It is too many women are still poor. So gender equity is still bad around the world, and we have uh, the share of women is, is employed in agriculture remains still dramatically high, and uh, only a few own the land. The land property is a disaster all over the world. In Africa, you can find even less than 10% the land owned by women. And the share of women in secondary and tertiary education remain badly unbalanced. There are countries in the G8, including mine, who has lent less than 10% of women in the parliament, less than 10% of women in the government. Thailand is doing a bit better in that regard. So that goal has been failed. Water and sanitation, 1.7 billion people have gained access to, to clean water. Great, congratulations. The world did well in that. Okay, that has been achieved. However, 884 million people still do not have access to drinking water. It's a big number. And 2.6 billion people do not have access to sanitation. 500 million people in India now are still defecating in, on the soil. They have no toilet. In the modern world, 50 years after reaching the moon, half a billion people don't have a toilet. So this goal has been failed. So we have now nine principles for global governance, of good governance. A respect for human dignity, human rights, equity. A responsibility, Father Neil mentioned, is the biggest world of modern times, a responsibility. Sustainability, in meeting present needs. Solidarity, not generosity. This is a big challenge to the Catholic and to the Christian in general. My first daughter, she's married to a Muslim engineer. They love each other very much. And uh, there is often a fight in discussion because they go together to the parish to do good, to help the poor. They, they love to serve food to the poor. They live in Geneva. And my son-in-law, who is a Muslim, say, what is this Christian thing that you give some money during the Mass on Sunday, and you have to decide how much we give. Is it 100 baht or 200 baht? It's voluntary. You decide whatever you want. If, if they pass around, you don't want to give anything, you don't give anything. It's a voluntary thing. In the Muslim world, it's compulsory. You cannot believe in God if you don't help the poor. Some question point coming from other religions. Subsidiarity between institutions, coherence with global rules and engagement, transparency in decision making. Are we transparent? How many governments in the world are transparent? They publish what they are doing. They publish the records of what they are doing. Right things and wrong things. Accountability. Greater credibility of the system. So responsibility is the word that connects all of this. Father Neil was right. The other key determinants of the modern world are people, planet, and profit. But what connects all of them is responsibility. There is now a new sense of responsibility. We challenge all our life every day. From the products we built, there are ways to extract coal. There are ways to use oil. There are ways to, to have an hotel. There are ways to produce a transportation. So from the workplace to the marketplace, we need a responsibility. Corporate social responsibility. My boss, Kofi Annan, at that time, he said that we cannot divide security, human rights, and development. We need all of the three of them. Like a table with three legs. If you remove one leg, the table will fall down. If you put one leg longer than the other, the table, you cannot eat on that. Security, fight against poverty, human rights. We need all of them. And that was year 2000, was before the 9-11. So already in the year 2000, Kofi Annan was telling the world, you need all the three. You cannot fight only one and forget the other. How many campaigners are doing the politician? Security first, forget about poverty. Others, Zapatero in Spain, po fight against poverty first, we don't care about the rest. And Ban Ki-moon, the President Secretary General, is now talking about the fact. 
Kofi Annan was saying the future will be like that. Ban Ki-moon is saying, let us face fact. The old model has collapsed. We need to create a new one with dynamic growth, focusing on decent jobs. Jobs is the response to all of this. What do the poor people want? The poor people want better jobs. So all kinds of human organizations have rediscovered the sense of responsibility, of empowerment. And uh, what kind of responsibility? Is my responsibility different from Kun Prachwab or from Bampu where he works? Is my responsibility different from the parish priest or from the bishop or from the cardinal or from the pope? No. We are all in the same network, in the same fabric. We are all connected. Like one of those bowls that I used, it, uh, the subrack bowl which is used. Everything is connected. There are people who don't think like that. They say, no, business cannot be responsible. The only responsibility of business doing is making money, making legally, of course, respecting the content of people, but responsibility have no, uh, business no responsibility. One of them is very famous, Milton Friedman. He said that the, the social responsibility of business is to increase profit. What does it mean to say that business has responsibility? Only people can have responsibility. Is that wrong? In a free society, business has as much responsibility as the rest, like government and civil society and NGO. So what is the future? The future is about entrepreneurs' responsibility. If you take a hundred largest economies of the world, how many nations you find? Take the hundred largest economies of the world. 49 are nations, 51 are companies. That means the companies are already becoming more important than nations. Therefore, governing companies is now changing. In 1970s, it was about uh, making the shareholders happy, then philanthropy, then corporate governance, then stakeholders engagement, then corporate accountability. Now it's about responsibility. Responsible companies are now the world of, of the future. And the evolution of system, sustainability, the same. We got the same evolution from managing quality now to sustainable, world sustainable. So shaping our future beyond 2015, after the Millennium Development Goals, what will be the new threat, the new challenges for global public goods? Mohammed Yunus, it seems that he had a talk with Father Neil, probably. He said, business is a beautiful mechanism to solve problems. But we never use it. We only use it to make money. It satisfies our selfish interest, but not our collective interest. He had Nobel Prize. I'm not against making money, but I'm saying we can do both. So money is a good tool, should not be the goal. Money is a tool to make a better society. We have designed the capitalist system wrong. We assume human beings are one-dimensional. All of them instead is about now making a money-centric world. Money commands everything because that's our interpretation of capitalism. But what kind of world is that? It's a very uncomfortable interpretation of human beings. We have been turned into a robot. Yes, we are selfish, but also selfless, but we don't allow the selfless be brought out. So let us, let allow me in a redemptorist house uh, to take out a bit of my Jesuit education. Tantum quantum, fundamental word of the Jesuit education. As much as, in Latin, tantum quantum means as much as. You need as much as respect of people and profit to protect the planet. We need uh, poverty to change and exchange with uh, prosperity. We need public goods and power to communicate. So if people will uh, respect the planet, it will be bearable. If people and profit cooperate, it will be an equitable world. If, people, if prof, planet and profit co collaborate, it's a viable world. But if we put all the three, planet, people and profit together, we are making a sustainable world. What do you think about this situation? It's taken in Bangladesh. 
you might think it's a challenge. If you, say it, if you take it as a business instead, it is, might be an opportunity. You see this? Is it a charity? Maybe it's a business. Is it a local farmer? Maybe it is a, a global supplier. Is the United Nations a, a barrier to a discussion? Or is it an enabler? You see this picture, what do you think? They're bringing some aid to the village. Is it aid or is it maybe talent being shared? You see this one, it's, oh, poor people with a mobile phone. A useless luxury. No, it is a necessity to check what is the, the price of that sheep on the market. It's taken in Somalia. People are using mobile phone to know the price of the market. This could be taken in Bangkok, it is not, but it's similar. It looks like a developed world, you go to Sukhumvit, and it is also a developing side of the world. There, are, there is also still poverty around. So all of it, uh, is it a challenge or is it an opportunity? Well, what percentage of the global population is expected to live in today, developing countries in 2050? When your children will be grown up, will be adult, owners of your company. 85% of the market is of the future is in the developing world. So what does it mean for business? It means for business that you must be there. Invest where it's going to grow. That means Cambodia, that means Myanmar, that means Timor. What percent of the world population is on less of 10%? 80% of the people. That is the future of the market. What does it mean for business? That opportunities for companies will be there. If you want to sell yogurt, you have 80% of people who now do not buy yogurt. If you want to sell mineral water, 80% of people don't buy mineral water. So that is the future of the market. Which areas of the world face the greatest income inequalities? China and Latin America. What does it mean for the world? It means that uh, we have to, to invest in those areas where there will be opportunities. How many people in the developing world do not have access to electricity in general, to energy? 1.6 billion. If you own a, an energy company, if you work for an energy company, that is where you have to invest. That are the people who are looking for new energy. What is the proportion of population under 24 in developing countries? People are very young, 48%. After, after the people, the world are the young people. Therefore, for the, what does it mean for business? It means that the growing number of young people in developing countries represent major new labor challenges for business. How many people in the world still have no access to sanitation? 1.2 billion. What a huge business is that, that you can invest in aqueduct and uh, activities for, for sanitation. So inequality, this is the Asian Development Bank. In spite of developing Asia greatest success, still we have growing disparities. This is a big challenge for business. Inequality is no good for business. Inequality kills business, makes the business unstable. So we have to reduce it. This pyramid of capitalist system looks like uh, developed by some communist. No, this was Franklin Roosevelt, United States president. And you probably you can't read it, but here's it at, at the bottom of the pyramid. We are work for all. We feed all. These are the peasants, the workers. And then we have, uh, we eat for you, second floor. Then we have, uh, we fight for you, we shoot for you. Then these are people, we fool you. Also some missionary here, but I don't want to make some fun of it. Then at the top, we rule you. But if you go to the top of the top, uh, it's the money. And that was President Roosevelt in 1932. So this challenge of enterprise-based approach is now what the change which is required. We have free basket. You can have a social enterprise, social issue oriented, the PDA, condom and cabbage restaurant, the Doi Tung, the Royal Project, 
These are social enterprises. Probably one of the best, but not all of them can be like that. You can be, however, inclusive business. That means doing good in all the value chain. That means how you produce, how you treat your people, how you produce the quality of your product. And then you have to think about this. This is the 80% of the business. At the bottom of the pyramid, there is a lot of business there to be done. So human rights, millennium development goals are connected, and we can rebuild the future of that. We have to focus on basics. This picture is taken from Rio de Janeiro during the meeting uh, to uh, plan the future of the world after 2015. There were three plus seven plus four. What does it mean? Three policy changes at global level. More integration and implementation and coherence. The world must integrate the economic, social, and environmental pillars at all levels. It must address the implementation of the sustainable development agenda and should lead to coherent policies. Se seven missions for this generation, for our generation. First, combat poverty. Second, build food security and sustainable growth. Third, the sound water management, energy access for everybody, sustainable cities, management of oceans, improving community resilience. And across the board about these seven things, a roadmap of good practices for the companies and for the governments. A green economy in the context of a sustainable development and poverty eradication. A global council for sustainable development. We need a kind of better global government. And a new global governance of the Earth environment. New and binding sustainable development uh, goals after 2015. There are books uh, who explain how this could work. Uh, you see humanity as a worldwide family. You have to love the others as much as you love yourselves. This is applicable to any Christian to its neighbors, with the other family in the condo, but also the other family in the other neighborhood. They are in the other towns, and why not? The other people across the board. We have to love the Cambodian people as much as we love the Thai people. And then we have to love the Chinese. And then we have to love the Africans. And then we have to love the, the world. Keep uh, your vision of the humankind as a global one. So these are the worlds of the future. The worlds of the future is about respect, responsibility, honesty, compassion. What would be our civil civilization look if we would adopt this world? Well, our civilization would be much better. All our human beings would be equal in dignity. It's article number one of the Declaration of Human Rights. We have all the same dignity and the same right on earth. We are all the same. We have all the same rights. Do you believe it? Does everybody believe that they have the same right than the parish priest or than the bishop or than the cardinal? Do you feel the same of the pope? We have all the same rights. And that's why we have all the same responsibility. It's too easy to say, oh, I am a minor person. He is the boss, he is the one who has to run the community. No, we have all the same responsibility. Life on the planet should not be devalued, and so we would prepare not only for after death, we should live a better world now. The virtue of tolerance and liberty will be proclaimed. Human solidarity will become a rule of life. Manipulation, domination of others, lies should be abolished in governance. There will be more reliance on reason, logic, and science, better care of the Earth's nat natural environment, land, soil, water, air, and space will be better protected, will be the end of the primitive practice of resorting to violence. It's the biggest error of the world. Too many wars. When we do not understand each other, we should. It's wrong, it's never worked once, never one war has solved the problem and we should stop it. There would be genuine democracy in the organization of public affairs and government, the most important task. The government's most important task will be to help develop the children's intelligence and the talent through education. This is the government's most important task. The rest can be done by business. 
So sustainable development is not uh, just uh, a dream, it is a must. It is not just an option. We must do it. Why we must do it? Because otherwise, we continue like that. We will then need two, two planets. Our global ecological footprint is already beyond 30% of what the planet can sustain. If our demands continue like that, if all the Chinese people buy as many cars as we bought in Bangkok, there will not be enough resource in the world to run them. If all the Indian people are going to do the same, we will go beyond the capacity of the planet. More than three quarters of the people live in nations that are ecological debtors. That means that we are exploiting the other people. But we don't have the other planet. Do you know what? If we burn this one, do you know where is the other one? I don't know. I don't think there is one. So we don't have a plan B. There is not another planet where to move. So we have to fix it now. And the little known uh, GIA that can have it working is more social business, more corporate social responsibility, more access to credit, and more access to market. If all of this can work properly, we can solve the problem. I want to give a few more minutes because I was asked to, to climate change adaptation. It's the biggest challenge. A lot of people don't have a sense of urgency. They think it will happen maybe in the year 3000. I, we don't really care. No, it will happen in the next generation, or maybe in this generation for those of you who are below 60 years old. All this climate change adaptation, we need to take action to help communities to adapt to the, new, to the ecosystem, how it is changing now. It's a complex way, but people in the board of companies should understand it because this is going to happen. And it's not that it happened once and we forget. We got the flood, you remember? We got the flood. It can happen. It can happen again. It can be bigger. This time, uh, Sukhumvit has been uh, saved. Next time, we, can, we could have water at the level of the altar in the Holy Redeemer Church. That is how the level can reach. It can happen, therefore we have to adapt to it and uh, mitigate the impact of all these greenhouses effect. Who said that? Is it Sandro Calvani who is uh, a bit uh, crazy on this? No, it is 2,500 scientists who review the International Panel of Climate Change. This is the best of the world science. They did by democracy, did they vote, and 200 were in favor, 500 was against, no. They did it by consensus. Unanimously agreed, 2,500 scientists from 120 countries, they agreed that this is going to happen. And these are the people who produced the, the, uh, the Intergovernmental Planet of Climate Change. Let me allow a few words on Charles Darwin. Some people don't like much, don't like him in the Catholic Church. But I did my thesis on that in the Jesuit high school, uh, and I passed the exam. So he said it is not the strongest of the species that survive, not the strongest. So it will not be the strongest airline. It will not be the strongest company. It will not be the strongest bank. It will not be the strongest nation. And it will not be the most intelligent that survive. It is the one which most adapt to change. So either people adapt or they will perish. Like a frog in the water, when you boil the water. At the beginning, the frog is happy, you know, it's a bit warmer. Then you increase the temperature, even more warmer. Then you got a cooked frog and it will die. Climate change, yes, is complex, but it's not a rocket science. You can understand how it works. And some of the basics should be taught in the school and should become the rule of the day. If your child stays under the shower 20 minutes, he's consuming 30 liters of water. That is more than most people of Africa have to drink and to live for a month. 
We have to understand these basics. Climate change is linked to other unsolved human causes. We need to mobilize world leaders. They will mobilize only if they feel our pressure to deal with climate change, economic upheaval, the pandemics, and so on, and ask the leaders to take consideration about it. Climate change is real. This is not the future, it's the past. This going, is what is, going, is happening now. Extreme temperature, floods, windstorms. We never seen so many in the past, and now in 20 years we got so much increase. Climate change kills is not a, a slogan of a university. It's a killer. 30 million people are likely to go hungry. And what would happen in Africa if instead of uh, 2 million like they are now, they will become 30 million in 20 years? If 30 million people can no longer live in sub-Saharan Africa, what will happen? They will move. And they will destabilize uh, the Middle East. They will destabilize Europe. They will destabilize the world. And you cannot fight them with a nuclear weapon. So we have to take these issues seriously at a global level. All adaptations are local, therefore everybody has to consider what is the right adaptation for that particular place. Adap adaptation is a management process, so it's something that the manager should handle, include activities that are taken before impacts and after impact. We need a, a reactive adaptation. In most circumstances, adaptation will incur in a long, long period. Climate change is a change. People don't like changes. This is Machiavelli. It ought to be remembered that there is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of the new order of things. People don't like change. However, change will happen, and uh, we have to learn uh, how to handle the various components of, of it. There is nothing permanent except change. Change will be part of our life more and more. If you are not part of the solution in the change management, you are then part of the problem. Imagination is more important than knowledge. If you don't know what happened, you can Google it. You find on Google the knowledge. But then when you have the knowledge on the screen, the difficult part is put it in your life. The, image, the creativity that you need to do that. And these are the local adaptations which are required for those of you who want to study more in depth. Are we going to do it? And are we going to do it soon enough? Well, again, uh, this Einstein, said the two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity. I'm not so sure about the universe. So we run the risk to be stupid and not understand our responsibilities nowadays. These are all the complex kind of changes at the international level, regional level, national situation, the kind of shift that every company should be able to lead. We learn that people change when they get hard. Is that true? When the water is coming up in your house, you understand what the flood is about. But we have to localize climate change to require an awareness by the people, understanding what are the causes, a sense of, of the problem matters, a capability to influence the outcomes, and the political will to deal with the problem. Barriers to adaptation are poor awareness, limited availability, but consider that in most situations, existing knowledge is already there. We do know what should be done, but start to do with the activities the most difficult part. So when you build a, build a bridge, consider whether the bridge is high enough. When uh, you build a road, consider what could be the risk of that road. Or it's better do a higher elevation. More research is definitely required in various fields of, of climate uh, uh, adaptation, uh, in particular on socioeconomic scenarios which will be required. Universities should be pushed to research more about that. We should start from the primary school to tell children that the future will be different from what we see now. 
And uh, remember that uh, an ounce of action is worth a ton of theory. People learn much more from action than what they learn from a theoretic aspect. Free re urgent research, in-depth research on climate change, in particular on, his, on the economic activity, uh, public health, all the implementation which is required. Improvement in environmental monitoring, that means a measuring system that we know better what is going on. And third, urgent research is development of analytical institutional capacity to use the data and also applying this to the land use planning and so on. This is the science of everybody for the future. The last word I wish to offer to you, I take it from Simon Trace, is also a Catholic, from Practical Action, is an NGO. And he says, the sense of well-being comes from more than just having one basic material needs. We often think to that. Let us give food, let us give education, let us give public health. It's not enough. It also requires a sense that you have a degree of control and power on your own life, that you can be a part, a decision that has major impact on the way of life. You have to empower people. We need those six billion brains around the world. You have to empower people in your company, not only the CEO. You have to empower everybody. And understanding that you can live in dignity, that you have the respect of your fellow citizen, and that you can live in peace with your neighbors. And I would like also to share the most important thing that I learned traveling around the world for 33 years all my life in 135 countries is that we can uh, really talk each other because we are all human beings. We've been taught we are all of the same species, homo sapiens, uh, homo means men and women. Sapiens means intelligent, smart. Are we really that smart? Are we running this planet properly? Are we really intelligent? We need a change, a change of species. Not only sapiens, not only intelligent, but solicitous, which in Latin means able to care, intelligent enough to care for the others. And that is the common language that we have all over the world and the common language that everybody can understand, the human hope. Thank you very much. Thank you.